As I was praying and pondering in preparation for this ninth session of our Mark the Way Bible study, I thought I might change the title of this talk or this session. I had originally, if you have your study guides, you'll notice on page 43 of the study guide that the session nine was originally called End of the Line. Well, as I was praying and, and, and reflecting, I thought maybe a better title might be The End of Ends. Because there is a kind of hesitation, uh, a reluctance in the human person to want to recognize that things will come to an end, that I will come to an end. <laughs> I remember uh, several years ago, uh, I was having a conversation with an altar server before Mass. He was a little guy, maybe 10, 11 years old. And I asked him if he knew how old I was. And he said he didn't know. And I said, well, I'm 49 years old. And he said, oh, okay. And I asked him, following that question, do you think that's very old? And he knew that was kind of a setup question. So he answered very diplomatically, no, no, I don't think that's very old. And then I asked him another question. I asked, do you think you'll ever be 49 years old? And without hesitation, he responded, no way. <laughs> so that was the real answer to the previous question. Do you think 49 is very old? He answered, no way am I ever going to get that old. What an honest answer. We believe that other people get old. Other people come to the end of their lives and, and die. But somehow we will escape that. We will escape our end. Somehow we're going to live forever. It's a kind of illusion that we live under. Well, as we get to Mark chapter 13, Jesus helps us to, to embrace that understanding that, no, no, not only will Father John turn 49 years old, but someday you will turn 49 years old and go beyond that and leave this world. This life on earth will come to an end. Jesus, of course, is talking about the end of the temple in Jerusalem, but that provides a perfect launching pad for us to talk about all kinds of ends. Uh, six ends in particular we're going to explore very briefly. And, and that's why I thought a better title for this session might be The End of All Ends. That everything in this world is passing until we come to eternal life that is eternal and never ending. Let's turn to Mark chapter 13 and, and just read a little bit as we prepare to, uh, to reflect on this great gospel written by the evangelist and bishop and martyr, St. Mark. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. I'm going to read from the beginning and almost the end of chapter 13. Chapter 13, verses 1 and 2, and then 32 and 33. And as Jesus came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what wonderful stones! And what wonderful buildings. And Jesus said to him, Do you see these great buildings? There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. Jesus continued, But of that day and that hour no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Take heed, watch, and pray, for you do not know when the time will come. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, you have sent us your Son into the world to teach us the way back home to you and to help us contemplate how all things in this world come to an end. Individually, we come to an end. The temple in Jerusalem came to an end. This whole world will come to an end. We pray that we are with you and with one another in eternal and endless bliss in heaven. We ask all this through the intercession of St. Mark and in the name of your Son, the all-powerful one, the conqueror of sin and death, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. St. Mark, evangelist, bishop, and martyr, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The end. <laughs> Not yet. We've got uh, this session and one more session to go. We've done quite a bit of uh, study now in the Gospel of Mark. Uh, if you would turn to page one of the study guide, I'd like to just quickly uh, do a flyby, like Tom Cruise liked to do a 
uh, a flyby, uh, buzz the tower, and see where we've been as we're almost coming to the end here, the penultimate session, session nine. We had the introduction to the Bible, dissecting the Bible, and an overview of the whole study of the Gospel of Mark, and now you know what it was like, almost. Session two was history aimed at a target, so we could see how you had uh, all of the history of the Old Testament, starting from Adam and Noah and Abraham and Moses and David, all kind of pointing to Jesus. That was the target of the whole Old Testament. It culminates and, and reaches a crescendo in the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem. Session three was the, the pregnant, powerful phrase that we explored called Israel of God from Galatians chapter 6, verse 16. How Israel has multivalent meanings. It means so many things depending on the context in which you hear that word Israel and especially Israel of God in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. The session, the fourth session, we looked at angelology, angelology and demonology. How all angels and demons came from the same uh, created being, came from angels that were originally in nine ranks of angels, as we read about in Ephesians 1 and Colossians chapter 1, and how the demons were the fallen angels, and how they are still uh, kind of interacting with us today. And St. Thomas Aquinas was a, was a master in helping us to discern how to listen to the good angels and how to ward off the evil angels. He, he showed us how they work their MO, their modus operandi. That was session four. Session five was enemy of my enemy. And of course, we know the old saying, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And so we looked at the neighbors of Jerusalem and Israel and how sometimes they were friend and how sometimes they were foe and how sometimes they flip-flopped between friend and foe. And it was often Israel and her king's um, mistaken understanding of who was friend and who was foe that that landed them in so much difficulty and turmoil. The prophets constantly calling them back to faithfulness to Yahweh and to God. And yet they went after um, uh, comfort and consolation among these nations. It's something we do too. Instead of finding comfort and consolation in Christ alone, we, we look to others and to uh, neighbors, uh, those around us. Uh, who sometimes are friends and sometimes is, are foes, and we can't tell the difference. Session six was the chain gang, <laughs> uh, based on the idea of the chain of being, this, this hierarchical ordering of being from God at the top and nothingness at the bottom, and how the coming of Christ sort of reverses the chain of being, and how in the old chain of being you had the greater and the stronger and the more powerful being served, by the poor and the weaker and the, the destitute. And how when Christ come, he, he comes, he reverses it. He who is the King of Kings has come to serve rather than to be served and shows us this is the way, uh, the way of Mark, <laughs> the gospel way, and that is the way of the cross. Uh, not just service, but ultimately even dying for one another. And so that was session six. Session seven was called Mountain Men, and we looked at Moses and David, both men who loved to climb mountains and who symbolized the two great covenants of the Old Testament. Moses on Mount Sinai, receiving the Ten Commandments and establishing the, the Mosaic Covenant, making Israel, the 12 tribes of Israel, into a nation. David, who goes up to Jerusalem, Mount Zion, and establishes the Davidic Covenant not only with the 12 tribes of Israel, but with all the nations. And his son Solomon, who is the man of wisdom, gives the books of wisdom to the nations as their law. Just as the law of the Ten Commandments was to rule the nation of Israel, so the law of wisdom was to rule the nations, the whole world. <laughs> and so the Davidic kingdom becomes a, a very apropos uh, preparation and symbol of the kingdom of Christ, who has come to rule the nations in the Catholic Church. And so that was uh, Mountain Men, Session 7. Session 8, the last session, we looked at Word of the Wise, 
uh, where we have in uh, chapter 12 uh, four questions that are put to Christ. Uh, and, and some of the questions are only traps. But one of the questions asked by a scribe ends up being a sign of great wisdom. And Jesus says to him, you have answered very wisely. Our questions, our wonder, our awe of the things around us, the, the creation uh, that God has made should lead us to some kind of wisdom, the beginnings of uh, understanding. And we looked at how uh, wisdom is really an end in itself. It is not for the sake of something else. So you, you rejoice in, in understanding, like you rejoice in playing, like you rejoice in praying, like you rejoice in love. It is not a tool to achieve something else. It is, it is its own end. And so that was word to the wise. Uh, as we have come to the word to the wise, let us review our quiz uh, for session eight before we dive into session nine. If you have your, your study guides, we're now on page 42 of Mark the Way. Quiz number eight. Number one, the Greek word for school, skole, literally means leisure. And that's true. You might remember I brought in uh, the book by Joseph Pieper, Leisure, The Basis of Culture. Fantastic book. Uh, and he begins to kind of unravel a lot of our misunderstandings about what school means, what leisure means, what wisdom means, what knowledge means. Uh, and so uh, that, was a, that was kind of an eye-opener for me. School means leisure. When you have time to study, you actually have leisure time. You don't have to be working. You have time for contemplation. Number two, according to John Henry Cardinal Newman, the knowledge of the gentleman is engineering, and that is false. With all due respect to my brother, who is a fantastic electrical engineer, uh, sorry, bro, that is not the knowledge of a gentleman. Rather, it is the artes liberalis, the liberal arts, philosophy, theology, <laughs> uh, literature, poetry, History, even. Uh, that's the knowledge of a gentleman. Number three, sapiential literature is the same as the historical books of the Old Testament. We know that's false. It's the same as the seven books called the, the wisdom books of the Old Testament, not the historical books. Number four is true. The book of Job ponders the question, why do bad things happen to good people? Truly a, a question for contemplation. Why do such things happen? We, we sit back, we contemplate, we wonder. That's the beginning of wisdom. And so Job is one of the books of wisdom. That is true. Number five, the Song of Solomon, also called the Song of Songs, was the prayer book of Jesus. So it should also be ours, and that is false. Uh, it is a wonderful book, but it was not the prayer book of Christ. That was the book of Psalms. Number six, St. Thomas Aquinas asked that the book of Psalms be read to him as he lay dying. <laughs> so number five and number six can be reversed. And that's false also because St. Thomas asked that the Song of Solomon or the Song of Psalms, that erotic love poetry, be read to him as he lay dying on his deathbed. Number seven, fear of the Lord is the end of wisdom and love of the Lord is its beginning. And that's reversed, and so it's false. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and love of the Lord is its end. Number eight is true. In antiquity, the Song of Solomon, I really kind of like the Song of Solomon. This is like the third statement that it's been in. Man, the Song of Solomon was used for sacramental mystagogy, and that's true. Um, you kind of had catechesis. You learned about the faith, the, the how and the what and the where and the and the, and, the, and the when, but then you get to the why. It is for contemplation and communion. The, the bride and the groom becoming one, uh, which is described in the Song of Songs. And so that's sacramental mystagogy, mystical union between Jesus, the bridegroom, and his bride, the church. So often, you know, when people go through RCIA, who want to become Catholic. They finish the RCIA, they receive the sacraments of initiation, sometimes baptism, but communion and confirmation, and then they're like, okay, I got my diploma, I'm done. 
But in a real sense, in the best sense, your preparation, your, your RCIA in some sense is just beginning. You've just learned the ABCs and the one, two, threes. Now you got to learn how to put it together into words and equations and, and use what you have learned to grow in communion with Christ. That's mystagogy, mystical union with Christ. So best uh, kind of worked through by reading the Song of Solomon. So number eight is true. Number nine, Sirach is sometimes called Ecclesiasticus, meaning the little book of the church. And number nine is true. Ecclesiasticus means little book of the church. Little, the church. And Sirach, you might remember, is one of those seven books that was excluded from the Protestant Bible. If you remember our mnemonic device about how to remember the seven books of the Old Testament that were removed from the, the Christian scriptures by Martin Luther in the 16th century? The wise Jews slipped, banishing first and second Maccabees. Tobit, Wisdom, Judith, Sirach, Baruch, first and second Maccabees. It, it helps me. I hope it helps you. All right. So number nine is true and number 10 is true. True wisdom allows us to see God's law ultimately embodies God's love. All right. Great review, I hope, for you uh, for session eight. A word to the wise. And now we get to the end of ends. The end of ends. Uh, let me just say a word about uh, the term eschatology. Whew. There's a 25 cent word for you. Eschatology. One of the subjects we studied when I was in seminary, eschatology. It's often the, the opposite of protology. And that is the study of the beginnings of things. So like the book of Genesis and the creation and the, the, the creation of the angels, protology. But then you have eschatology, which is the opposite end of the spectrum, which is the last things, the study of the last things. And by the way, traditionally in Catholic theology, what they taught us in the seminary, where there are four last things, death, judgment, heaven, and hell. These are the four last things traditionally uh, understood as eschatology in, in uh, Christian tradition. We will all die, except for my little altar server who thought he was never going to turn 49 years old. <laughs> He's going to live forever. Uh, we will all be judged at the end of our lives. We will either go to heaven, God willing, or, God forbid, we will go to hell. And just, uh, just a little surplus uh, meaning here. The Greek word eschaton or eschatos really means last or furthest or uttermost, the most extreme end. So if I had a chance to rename this session, I would call it the end of ends instead of the last things. What I'd asked you to read was Mark chapter 13, verses 1 through 37, which is the whole of the chapter. And, uh, and the footnotes on page 92 to uh, 90 to 92, and the essay, End of the World, in the Ignatius Catholic Study Bible, page 50. And what that essay, The End of the World, on page 50, if you don't mind, if you have your Bibles, if you would turn to that, it's actually in, in the discussion of the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 24, which is where Jesus, this is the parallel text, to Mark 13. This is where Jesus is predicting the end of the temple. And so that is where um, we find this, this, uh, this little excursus of the end of the world uh, by Curtis Mitch or uh, Scott Hahn, who are the editors of the ICSB. Uh, I'm not going to read all this, but what, uh, what they point out here is that Jesus is referring first and foremost to the end of the Jerusalem temple. And we just read that for our, our opening prayer and meditation, which was Jesus is looking at this magnificent temple, greatly expanded and built by King Herod the Great. And as his apostles are in awe and, and wondering about it, in fact, the wall that faced the Mount of Olives, the eastern wall, of the Temple Mount was 300 uh, feet high, 300, three football lengths. 
uh, I'm sorry, 300 yards high, uh, three football uh, lengths tall. So you can, you can understand the apostles all and uh, thinking that this will last forever. <laughs> They're almost like my little altar server thinking, well, I'm going to live forever. They thought this temple in Jerusalem was going to last forever. And yet Jesus said, this is going to come to an end within a generation, within 40 years. Jesus is roughly making that prediction around 30 AD. And what happens in 70 AD? The destruction of the Jewish temple. The destruction of the Jewish temple. And that's what we're going to look at. So that's the, that's, the, that's the background. That's the setting in which we want to look at various kinds of ends. Not just the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, uh, but also the end of each person. My end and your end. The end of all of humanity, what's going to happen when all of human history comes to an end? What about the end called the rapture? We hear our Protestant brothers and sisters often quoting 1 Thessalonians 4.17 and saying we'll all be caught up into the heavens at the sound of the trumpet, at the rapture. We're going to talk about that. And then the end of death. There will be a time when death itself will finally be destroyed as we read in 1 Corinthians 15. And then we will look at the end of the apocalypse. Okay, How all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, talk about the end. John does it in a separate book besides his Gospel. All right, so that is what we're going to look at for the next few minutes together. So if you turn to page 43 in your study guide, we're going to look at the end of Jerusalem. Number two, letter A. Just as Jerusalem underwent a particular judgment in 70 AD, when General Titus, he's the Roman general in charge of uh, the Roman 10th Legion, and destroyed Jerusalem and the temple, so the whole world will undergo a general judgment at the end of time. What happened to Jerusalem in miniature? is going to happen to the whole world in, in its fullness. This is kind of a preview of coming attractions, <laughs> is Jesus' point in Mark 13. What has happened here in Jerusalem will happen uh, at the end of time. But let's not run ahead to the end of time. Let's look a little bit more closely at the end of the temple and the end of Jerusalem, and really the end of the Old Testament. It is not an exaggeration to say that with the destruction, the absolute annihilation of the temple in Jerusalem, the Old Testament came to a cataclysmic and complete end. That is not an exaggeration. You no longer had the altar of sacrifice. You no longer had pilgrimages to Jerusalem so that people could offer sacrifice on the altar of sacrifice. You no longer had the Holy of Holies, where the high priest could enter on the Day of Atonement, on Yom Kippur, and offer sacrifice. You no longer had uh, the candelabras. And so you couldn't celebrate the, uh, oh, what is that feast? Uh, the Feast of Lights. Um, Hanukkah. <laughs> That's what I was thinking of. The Feast of Lights Hanukkah, when commemorating Judas Maccabeus. Uh, reconsecrating the temple um, and, and lighting the menorah, the festival of lights, Hanukkah. Since you didn't have the temple, you couldn't do any of these things. You no longer had a Levitical priesthood whose purpose was to offer the sacrifice. You no longer had a high Aaronic priesthood descended from, a uh, from Aaron. You really had the closing of the book of the Old Testament with the conclusion and the destruction of uh, the temple and Jerusalem. Probably one of the best books you can read, although it's not an easy read, mind you, it wasn't easy for me, is this one uh, by Flavius Josephus. I don't know if you can see that very well, but Flavius Josephus. He was a Jewish rebel uh, during the, there, there was a revolt of the Jews against the Romans. This is around 66 AD and lasted about four years till 70 AD. And in the beginning, uh, Josephus was fighting on the Jewish side. 
So he was leading uh, one of the small uh, uh, groups of soldiers and he was captured and he was taken prisoner in Rome uh, and he was held by Vespasian uh, who became the emperor. And Vespasian's son, Titus, is now leading the 10th army, the 10th legion of the Roman army against Jerusalem. And Vespasian sends Josephus to stay right beside Titus and record what is happening. So what you have here is an eyewitness testimony of the destruction of the Jerusalem temple and all of Jerusalem uh, by Titus. And so uh, good, good source and a very, a very early source for that information. It really makes it one of the, the primary sources to understand what happened in the first century. So letter B there, and Jesus said, we read this at the beginning of our time together today. And Jesus said, do you see these great buildings? This is the Herodian uh, structure, this temple mount that he had greatly expanded and enhanced. There will not be one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And Josephus records how it was absolutely annihilated. Uh, there was not one stone left upon another. And then we hear in Mark 13, verses 24 through 27, that Jesus is not only talking about the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, but this is a precursor, kind of a preview of what will happen at the end of time. But in those days, Jesus said, after the tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. And then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. So now Jesus has switched from talking directly about the temple to talking about the end of the world. And, uh, and, and, it, and it is, in a sense, simultaneous, because for the Jews, it was the end of their world. As I just mentioned, in, in the destruction of the temple, they no longer had a calendar by which they could celebrate these feasts. They, they didn't know and they had no way to fulfill the three great pilgrimage feasts, the Feast of Passover, the Feast of, the feast of Pentecost, and the Feast of Booths or Tabernacles. They couldn't go up to Jerusalem to celebrate these feasts in the temple because there was no temple. It was the end of their world as they knew it. So that's the first end uh, the end of Jerusalem. And you can see how there are even multiple layers, even as we talk about the end of Jerusalem. Not only the end of a city, but it's the end of the whole Old Testament, in a sense. Making way, a new way, <laughs> mark the way uh, for Christ to come and lead us out of slavery and bondage into freedom. Uh, but it's also a... Uh, preparation for the end of the world and how we should always be prepared and watch and ready. That's why I wanted to read from Mark 13 verse 32 because we recently had all these you know things happening around here around the world the fires and the floods and locusts and, and all kinds of things and uh, I was interviewed by a local TV station asking if this was a sign of the end of the world and I said not a chance. Because it says very clearly in Mark chapter 13, verse 32, that no one knows the end, when it will happen, neither the day or the hour, and therefore watch. It doesn't mean we don't know, so kick back and take it easy. It means we don't know, so you better be on full alert and paying attention. Okay, let's look at the, uh, the next kind of end, the end of each person. And sometimes we can really be confused by this, we can really be confused by this. Uh, sometimes we think that when we die, that, 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 that's a freedom. And the soul is released from this prison of the body. And now we are free to go to heaven and live happily ever after. Not so. Not so. Uh, that was the thinking of Plato, uh, who said that the soul is in the body like a captain is inside of a ship. And so the captain can get off the ship and the ship can stay on in, in the harbor and the captain goes off and lives happily ever after. That is not the best way to think about the relationship of the soul and the body. Uh, at the end of our earthly life, the soul is separated from the body and that is a tragic time. 
we will not fully be ourselves until our souls are reunited with our bodies. And, you know, I had a very interesting uh, way of capturing this by a, a, a professor who teaches at, uh, I think it's Boston College, Peter Kreeft. He's written a lot of books, great books. Very easy to understand. Very great. He really explains theology in layman's terms. And he explained why we are frightened by both ghosts and zombies. <laughs> Have you ever thought about this? Because both ghosts and zombies are only 50% human. Think about that. A ghost is a soul without a body, a spirit without a body that it should have. It's only 50%. And what is a zombie? A body without a spirit, right? Mindless, <laughs> roaming around, <laughs> sucking people's blood or whatever it is they do. Uh, so that's why we're scared of them. That's why they make such great horror movies because they're only 50% human and we react to that in a very repulsed way, because we know deep down that when we die, we are not, when the soul is separated from the body, we are not 100% human. It is not until the soul and the body are reunited in the resurrection of the dead that we have ourselves our, in, 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 its, in our fullness, in our full identity, body and soul. Uh, that's why um, there's so much confusion around cremation these days. After somebody dies, have you heard about this? You know, people, and the Catholic Church approves uh, cremation. But I think there's a very great danger there that people think that now that the, the soul is no longer with this body and this body has been cremated, we can do whatever we want with the cremains. And that's a great confusion. And that's unfortunate. Because those cremains still have a destiny to be reunited with that soul. And that human person is not full 100% himself or herself until those cremains are united, glorified uh, with that person. Uh, and so, uh, letter C there, belief, this is from the Catechism of the Catholic Church, belief in the resurrection of the dead has been an essential element of the Christian faith from its beginnings. That these bodies, even the cremated bodies, will rise from the dead. They're not just going to stay in their graves forever. The resurrection of the body. We even say that in the creed every Sunday. Think about that. Your bodies will rise. God will. And the creed don't rise. Okay, so that's the second kind of end. The end of the person with the separation of the body and the soul. But we got to get back together. Let's look at the third end. The end of humanity. And here again, there may be some things that we kind of have uh, uh, fudged up in our minds. We need to unfudge it. <laughs> uh, so we're at the bottom of page 43. Catholics believe in two judgments, a particular judgment and a general judgment. Remember the four things that we said is eschatology, death, death, judgment. Uh, so there are two kinds of judgments. And we're going to look at that. The particular judgment occurs at the moment of death. So, at the moment the soul is separated from the body, God reveals to us our eternal destiny. And our souls either go to one of three places. Hell, purgatory, or heaven. Our bodies, meanwhile, are buried in the ground. Even if they're cremated, they should be buried in the ground or in a columbarium. But someplace respectful, consecrated ground. So we read from the Catechism of the Catholic Church, just so you think I didn't, just so you know I didn't make this up, in number 1022. Each man receives his eternal retribution in his immortal soul at the very moment of his death, the separation of the body and the soul, in a particular judgment. There's the, there's the key phrase, particular judgment. That refers his life to Christ. Either entrance into the blessedness of heaven through a purification. That's purgatory. Or immediately, or immediately an everlasting damnation. That would be the escalator down. Hell, God forbid. So that's the particular judgment. The way I like to try to look at it is, that's when we get our report card. As priests, one of our favorite things to do, because we can kind of mess with the kids in school, is to go and hand out the report cards. We get to see the report card. <laughs> and then we hand it to the poor kid who's sitting there trembling, 
and he or she gets to see the report card. And that's the particular judgment. Each person gets their report card from God. Okay, now the general judgment occurs at the end of time when the Lord returns in glory. So this is fast forward to the end of time, as Jesus was talking about the end of the destruction of Jerusalem, but then he talked about the end of time. Okay. Uh, and everyone receives their eternal destiny. <laughs> as I said, everyone gets to see everybody else's report card. So you have to walk around, turn your report card around so that everybody can see it. What grades did you make in living this moral Christian life? Did you get an A? Did you get a B? Did you get a C? Did you get an F? And we'll all get to see each other's report cards. That's the general judgment. And so we read from the Catechism, number 1040, the last judgment will come when Christ returns in glory. We shall know the ultimate meaning of the whole work of creation. What was God up to from the beginning? We shall know the ultimate meaning of the whole work of creation and of the entire economy of salvation and understand the marvelous ways by which his providence led everything toward its ultimate end. The end of ends. I should have written that up there somewhere. Okay, turn the page, please, to page 44. Between the two judgments, the particular judgment, my moment at the end of death, I get my report card, and the general judgment, we get to see everybody else's report card, we have this interim period and place that we go to called purgatory. Most of us are going there. Let's hope. And, and just for some scriptural background for this, because this is one of the things, if not the main thing, that sparked the Protestant Reformation. Do you, do you remember this? This is the 1400s, the 1500s. The church is promoting uh, indulgences. Uh, you can make a donation. You can have prayer said for those who have died so that they will have their time in purgatory shortened and get to heaven faster. And so that's, that's the idea of indulgences. We make a donation, we say prayers, and people in purgatory get out faster. And you might think, well, where in the world does it say that in the Bible? Well, I'm going to tell you. If we have to go back to the Old Testament, 2 Maccabees. Uh, Judas Maccabeus, the great uh, religious and um, uh, military leader, uh, leading a fight against the Seleucids, Antiochus Epiphanes IV, to be precise, who has set up a statue of Zeus in the Jerusalem temple. This is around the year 167 BC, 167 BC, Judas Maccabeus, the time of the Maccabean revolt. And Judas Maccabeus tells his soldiers, prepare yourselves, say your prayers, uh, dedicate yourself to God, Yahweh, the one true God, and we're going to go into battle and we're going to be victorious. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn to 2 Maccabees chapter 12. The citation is there, verse 46, but I'm going to back up to verse 39. On the following day, since the task had now become, become urgent, Judas and his companions went to gather up the bodies of the fallen. So they've had the battle, and now they're going to uh, take care of those who have died, who have come to their end, and bury them with their kindred in their ancestral tombs. Verse 40. But under the tunic of each of the dead, they found amulets sacred to the idols of Jannia. So some of them had, had committed sacrilege by wearing these amulets. These are the soldiers of Judas Maccabeus. So it was clear to all that this was why these men had fallen. So now if you'd fast forward to verse 43. He, meaning Judas Maccabeus, took up a collection among all his soldiers, amounting to 2,000 silver drachmas. A donation was taken up by Judas Maccabeus, which he sent to Jerusalem. Why? to provide for an expiatory sacrifice, to have prayers and sacrifices offered on the altar in Jerusalem that didn't exist after 70 AD. In doing this, he acted in a very excellent and noble way, praying for the dead to help them get out of purgatory, inasmuch as he had the resurrection in mind. For if he were not expecting the fallen to rise again, it would have been superfluous and foolish to pray for the dead. Wow! 
It's really hammering it home. But if he did this with a view to the splendid reward that awaits those who had gone to rest in godliness, it was a holy and pious thought to pray for the dead, just like we Catholics do. Have a mass offering offered for those who have passed so that they might have their sins expiated in purgatory and receive eternal life. Thus he made atonement for the dead that they might be absolved from their sins even after they had died. This is one of the reasons why uh, Martin Luther, on his own in volition, decided we're going to have to take these seven books out of the Old Old Testament. What was one of those seven books? Second Maccabees. Why did he want to get rid of Second Maccabees? Well, read Second Maccabees twelve forty six. <laughs> so it talks about praying for the dead. It was justifying not the abuses, but the authentic teaching of uh, indulgences. Uh, I'm, I'm so happy here at Immaculate Conception because we have a wonderful tradition of whenever there is a funeral, our, our church offices are just flooded with mass offerings and intentions. And, and so we've always have for every mass during the week and on the weekends, intentions, people making small donations, making a sacrifice so that the sacrifice of the mass might be offered for those who have fallen like Judas Maccabeus did, did, and that is a holy and pious thought. So that is uh, the third kind of end, the end of humanity, and we want to plug purgatory a little bit there. Now we look at the end of the rapture. And again, another scripture quotation that often our Protestant brothers and sisters cite, and I'd like to read it for you just so you're familiar with it. First Thes, that's how the, the cool kids say it, First Thes, uh, 1 Thessalonians 4.17, uh, we read, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the archangel's call, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first, those who have already died. But there's some who haven't died yet. What will happen to them? Then we who are alive, who are left, shall be caught up, raptured, together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall always be with the Lord. And that is often cited by our Protestant brothers and sisters, especially those uh, who are uh, more fundamentalist, evangelical in their spirituality, uh, to say that uh, Christ will return at the end of time and people will be raptured right out of their cars, right out of their classrooms. And so you have cars driving off the side of the road uh, do you remember that series? I think it was uh, Tim LaHoy who wrote uh, Left Behind. Uh, that was trying to describe First Thes 4.17. Uh, what would happen to those who are raptured up and those who are left behind after the cars have been emptied of the elect, swept up into heaven at the trumpet? Well, how do we understand that? Let's look at number five, letter A. First Thes 4.17 speaks about being caught up raptured when the Lord returns, but we Catholics understand that as the general judgment, okay, at the end of time. Those will be numbered among the sheep and not the goats, and that's a reference to Matthew chapter 25, where we hear about Christ returning at the end of times on the clouds, and he separates all of humanity with the, the sheep on his right and the goats on his left, because they loved the least of Christ's brothers and sisters. In a very real sense, the only people, the only person who has ever been raptured, in the sense that Protestants interpret 1 Thessalonians 4.17, is our Blessed Mother Mary. Because at the end of her life, she did not experience death. Body and soul, she was assumed into heaven. That's what we celebrate every August 15th. The assumption, by the power of God, of Mary, body and soul, into heaven. If she had been driving around in a car, she would have been raptured up. So Mary is the only one who has been raptured uh, in the Protestant sense, uh, Protestant interpretation of First Thess 417. All right, so that's number four. Number five, the end of death. And we're going to look at the two deaths, and we're going to do this very briefly because I'm starting to run out of time, in Genesis and in Revelation. And this is really the, 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 uh, the trap and the trick that causes Adam and Eve to trip. How's that for alliteration? Um, so what is it? The devil in the book of Genesis 
confuses two kinds of death, the death of the body and the death of the soul. The death of the body is what we know we're very familiar with. When this body's heart stops beating, the, the brain function ceases, we stop breathing. That's the death of the body. But there is another kind of death, the death of the soul, which we experience when we commit a mortal sin. In that sense, God's life that is in the soul leaves. Uh, and, and the soul has merely uh, mortal, earthly life. Okay, let's look at that. So God says, God is talking about death to Adam and Eve in the spiritual sense. But Satan, the devil, will come on the scene and talk about death in the bodily sense. And that's the source of the confusion. And that's how he gets Adam and Eve to sin. I know I'm going through this kind of quickly, but let's look at those scripture passages. Genesis chapter 3. The snake asked the woman, Did God really say you shall not eat from any of the trees in the garden? The woman answered the snake, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. It is only about the tree of the fruit in the middle fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden that God said you shall not eat it or even touch it or else you will die. Which death? Physical death? Spiritual death? Was God talking about? He was talking about a spiritual death. But the snake said to the woman, you certainly will not die. Which death was the snake talking about? He's talking about physical death. And then Eve takes a bite of the fruit, the forbidden fruit. And what happens? She did not physically die, just like the snake said. But she did spiritually die, just like God said. Because she committed uh, an act of disobedience to God's command. Okay, so God was referring to spiritual death, sin, which kills the soul. Satan was referring to physical death, which kills the body. And it was Satan's deliberate confusion uh, of Adam and Eve that caused them to fall. Okay, let's look at letter B. Jesus might destroy... Okay, this is from Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14 through 15. And Hebrews ties to help us understand the two meanings of death and how we need to keep those two very clear. Jesus might come and destroy him who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong bondage. The devil does have the power to destroy us physically. We see a dramatic illustration of that in the book of Job, in which the devil really punishes Job, just short of killing him. But he clearly has power of his physical well-being. And so we become enslaved to him, just like Adam and Eve were. We didn't want to die physically. We don't want to suffer physically. And so we do what he says. We give in to his temptations. But Jesus has come to show us how to pick up the cross, the way of the cross, the way of the gospel of Mark, the way of the kingdom. And that is how we reject Satan, by learning to embrace our cross. And deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong bondage. Hebrews refers to the death of the body and suffering, which is a little death, which we fear, and so we obey the temptations of the devil. This is just recapping what I just said. And I'm convinced there is not a sin on earth that is not a running away from suffering. And that's why we do what Satan says. He says, you will not die because I will cause you to die or I will make you suffer unless you do what I say, unless you give in to these temptations, and we take it. We run with it. In Revelation chapter 2, verses 10 through 11, and also in Revelation 20 and 21, we hear about these two deaths. The first death is the death of the body. The second death is the death of the soul. Be faithful unto death, we read in Revelation 2, and I will give you the crown of life, faithful unto physical death. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who conquers shall not be hurt by the second death, the death of the soul. The second death in Revelation 2, 20 and 21 refers to the spiritual death of hell. And the first death is bodily death, also used by Satan to confuse Adam and Eve and us. I hope you got all that because I'm running out of time. <laughs> and I just wanted to uh, 
uh, and then we're not going to go into this end of the apocalypse, uh, but just to say that there are three little apocalypses in Matthew 13, Mark 24, and Luke 21. And John's apocalypse, you know, there are four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, is the whole book of Revelation. So don't worry, John didn't forget it. And I just wanted to point out this timeline very briefly. Uh, it's really kind of neat because it shows how from uh, the whole of history, from creation all the way to the parousia. Parousia means the coming of Christ, the, the eschaton, the last, the last thing. And so it's kind of neat to see the whole panoramic view of human history there as we talk about the end of ends. Let's end with a prayer. Uh, and I'd like to just say as our concluding prayer, the Hail Mary, because we want our Mother Mary to hold our hands. <laughs> as we talk about these rather uh, overwhelming things about death and, and the end of history and humanity and so forth. And the reason I like to say the Hail Mary is because at the end of the Hail Mary, we say, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. So we want Mary to always keep us close to her son, Jesus. He was the, the way, the truth, and the life. And someday we will face our own end. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. St. Mark, Evangelist, Bishop, and Martyr, pray for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.